you can offset those amounts. So what I'm, what I'm saying with that is, should the company show a 19,500 DTA on their books and actually have an asset sitting there of 19,500 and it also have a liability sitting there of 10,500, or should it just show a $9,000, bless you, a $9,000, another one, no, yes, or should it just show a $9,000 DTA? And for the situations that we're looking at, it is fine to just leave it down as a $9,000 DTA. It is fine to leave it as two different things. We're happy either way. So if you wanna leave it just like that, you can do that. If you wanna get rid of the DTL and just have a $9,000 DTA, you can do that as well. It's not an issue with what we're doing. Um, and when we come back to the slides, we'll talk about why that is. Um, so what I'm talking about again is offsetting and in certain circumstances you are allowed to offset and in that case you only have to show the net of what you're dealing with. Um, but in those circumstances generally are when you are dealing with the same tax authority for everything. So if you're based wholly in Australia and just dealing with the ATO then you should be able to offset what you're doing because it's all dealing with the Australian tax, of the tax office. But if you're dealing with multiple different, different tax authorities in multiple different countries, then you may not be able to do it. Um, and it's probably likely that you can't. But from our point of view, you're dealing with Australian companies in Australia, we're happy for you to be able to offset that. Um, so there's a few other bits and pieces and whilst it's miscellaneous, there are actually some things which we definitely need to have a look at. Um, so how to deal with the change in the tax rates, how to deal with tax losses, and how to deal with asset revaluations. So a change in tax rates. The federal government is talking about, or the new federal government is talking about changing, uh, changing the corporate tax rate. And it's talking about a slight reduction in that corporate tax rate. So the issue is what do we do in that situation? So when the tax rate changes, all the calculations of DTAs and DTLs we need to adjust because those were based on the previous tax rate. Um, and it's probably easiest to do this with an example. So, so imagine we have imagine we have a situation where we have long service leave provision. of $50,000 and the tax rate is 30%. We have, we know that gives rise to a temporary difference of 15,000 and the DTA that comes out of that, oops, I've already jumped the head, sorry. Temporary difference is 50,000. The DTA is 15,000 times 30. What am I doing? It's $15,000. I've already times it by 30%. It's getting too late. There we go. Got there in the end. So we have a temporary difference of $50,000. The DTA that comes from that um, is $15,000, which is 50,000 by 30%. Now, the government's only talking about a one or 2% decrease. If I can empower, I'm gonna make it a lot bigger decrease, plus it makes it a lot easier with the calculation. So I'm gonna drop it to 10%. Business council would love me. If I drop it to 10%, that means that deferred tax asset is not gonna be worth $15,000 anymore because the whole point of the $50,000 provision is when you get that leave taken, it's, it's predicated or it was predicated on a 30% tax rate. So you're gonna be better off to the tune of $15,000. Now that the tax rate's dropped, the benefit from that deduction has dropped as well. 
So we need to figure out, and this would happen before you do all the rest of it. So you look at what the opening balances were and you'd make adjustments to that. So the temporary difference, that from the opening one is still 50,000. So we end up with a new DTA based on that opening of $50,000 times 10% gives you $5,000. So the old DTA based on the old tax rate was 15. The new DTA based on the new tax rate of 10% is only five. The DTA has dropped by 10. So credit DTA, what's that amount? 10,000. Well, you debit income tax expense, 10,000. Um, and we pick up that amount there. So that's the first thing that, that's what we do. And obviously with deferred tax liabilities, deferred tax liabilities would also drop and you would see a benefit from that side of things. Um, but it's just changing, even though the temporary difference is the same, the amount of the benefit in this case from the temporary difference changes and we need to reflect that change. Tax losses. Now, when a company makes a profit, so I make, I've got a small, well not a small business, I've got a, a actually even if it is a small business, it kind of all works the same. I've got a small business, I make $1,000 of profit, and if I'm, and it's a, and it's an incorporated business, so it works on the, on the company tax rate, I would have to pay the government $30,000, um, $30,000, $30, $30,000 on a $1,000 profit's a good deal for the government. I'd pay the government $30. So I would debit tax expense, credit cash, because I'm good and I'll pay up front, I credit cash $30. If I make a tax loss of $1,000, the government's not gonna turn around and give me $30. That's not the way that that works. And if you've done tax law, you're probably aware of that, or if you've been running your own business, well, hopefully running your own business, not making losses, but if you have, you may have been aware of that as well. If you make a loss, you do get a benefit, you will get a benefit from it, but that's when you start making profits again. So you get to roll that loss forward and get to use that to offset future profits to, to, so you, that you pay less tax in the future. So these are what are called a carry forward benefit and you get to realize that benefit somewhere down the line, um, hopefully when you start making money. So the journal entries, just to formalize it a bit, would be I would debit DTA $30 and credit income tax expense $30. I wouldn't debit cash, so it's not just a straight reversal. Now, I then start making a whole bunch of money down the line, and whenever that starts to happen, I'm gonna have an income tax expense and that will get worked out just like normally. But the consideration for that isn't cash all right now. So if I started making money down the line and started having to pay tax, some of that, that credit income tax payable, that is the amount of money that I'd have to pay, but after taking into account the $30 benefit that I had. So if I owed $80 next year, I'd only have to pay the government $50. So all up, I'm out of, my, out of pocket $50, but instead of getting $30 and then paying 80, I'm just not doing anything and then paying 50. So it's just picking up that idea that you have a deferred tax asset not just from temporary differences, but also from tax losses. Uh, and lastly, asset revaluations. So we have an asset revaluation, we debit asset, we credit revaluation surplus. Now what an asset revaluation is saying is that implicitly that asset is worth more. Now the thing is for tax, um, it doesn't say that here. For a tax point of view, the tax base of the asset, you're not, you're not gonna be able to revalue the asset for tax purposes. So if that you had a $100 asset and it's now $120, the tax base of the asset or the, the cost of the asset for tax purposes, that doesn't go up to 120, that just stays at 100. Um, so if you were to sell that asset straight away after the revaluation, you're still gonna make a $20 profit for tax purposes and they're still gonna make you pay tax on $20. 
So using that same, those same numbers, when we revalue that asset, we go from 100 to 120, we would debit the asset 20, and normally we'd credit revaluation surplus 20. But what we're picking up is that of that $20, imagine if we sold that asset tomorrow after doing this. So imagine we sell it out straight away. And if that's the case, for accounting po an accounting purpose, we would debit cash 20 and we would credit asset 20. Sorry, credit, sorry, debit cash 120 and credit asset 120 because we're selling it for 120. We haven't made any accounting profit on it. But if we sold it for tax purposes, I mean, same sale, but we've gone an asset of 100 on our books for tax purposes, sell of 120, we made a $20 taxable profit, which we would pay tax of $6 on. And that's what this is picking up, that even though we haven't sold it yet, if we were to sell it based on this value of 120, we would have to pay $6 in tax because of the profit that we're gonna make. So if we have a revaluation, we've got to pick up that difference in the deferred tax liability. Um, so the very final bits of this, and this kind of getting at the conceptual point of view, with a deferred tax asset, and thinking back to the framework, do you really have an asset? Because is there a future benefit? Well, there kind of is. I mean, you do get a future benefit, but it's contingent on things happening. If those things never were to happen, so if we have an asset and I'm just trying to think of an asset where this could happen. But if you have something, if you have a deferred tax asset um, sitting there, it may never actually happen that you get the benefit from it. You may have a situation where you're, you never make profits again. And if you're never going to make profits again and you think you're never going to make profits again, you're going to impair it down. But if you were never going to go make profits again, you've got nothing to write it off. You've got, no, you you got nothing sitting there where you can use that deferred tax asset. So it is contingent on something happening. And so arguably you say it shouldn't be something which is recognized, maybe you disclose this fact, but maybe it's not an actual asset as we normally would think of an asset. Um, do you control the asset? Again, I mean, you kind of do, because you kind of can say when that event occurs, if it does occur, but then with tax profits, maybe you don't control that. The government could just completely change the legis legislative framework and just change how taxation works, that could completely wipe it out. So you don't have control over those factors either. So, um, and it's not like if you went bust, you can't come up knocking on the, on the government's door and saying, you owe me money. If I had my small business and I had a $30 DTA because of a tax loss I had and I went broke, I couldn't claim that $30 from the government. So is it a real asset in that respect? Um, with a DTL, same sort of deal. If I've got a DTL, I don't owe the government money. It's not like they can come knocking on my door and say, you owe us money, where is it? It's just an artifact of how this process works. So, I don't know, it's again, how it really fits into the framework. It's, is there a present obligation? Um, there isn't another party to it in a sense that you have a deal, there isn't any sort of obligation sitting on you. So it's questionable about whether or not that's actually a real liability. So looking at DTOs and DTLs, a lot of analysts will actually discount a lot of these values because they don't think that they're real assets and liabilities. I mean, they're real to the extent that you see them on balance sheets, but they're not real to the extent that they don't seem to operate much like other assets and liabilities. Um, plus, a lot of people just have no idea what the hell they are. Like if you ask someone, we, people already have problems, even financial journals have problems when they look at profit and loss statements and assume that the income tax expense is how much somebody paid. Um, it's not something that's well understood. So in hindsight, there are a couple of takeaways. I know there's this stuff on the sheet here, but the first thing, you know, if anything, what you see on the income statement as a profit and loss 
um, sorry, in the profit and loss statement, um, as the income tax expense may not necessarily be how much tax the company pays. You've got to look a little bit deeper how it's all worked out. Um, secondly, an understanding, I suppose, of the difference between how accounting for accounting, accounting for tax works and then how just tax works and why those differences exist. And third thing, just being able to work through a current and a deferred tax situation. So if you can go through pretty much what we did plus all the add-on bits, um, you're looking pretty fine for that. So that's got me covered for, for tonight. So if anyone's got any questions, please come feel free to have a chat. Next week we'll be looking at cash flows and that will be the final topic for the semester. All right. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. <laughs>